Welcome back guys. Now previously you saw my dad do a video um, over the gun industry and just how wonky it is. Uh, Bear Creek saw that video and they asked us if we would take a video or a rifle of theirs and do a video on it. So now we're gonna go from top to bottom and I'm gonna show you what we changed and what they offer right out of the box. What we changed out is the stock. We threw a ambi selector on there and we threw a upgraded three pound trigger in there if you want to learn more about our upgrades you can find them in the description down below so first things first cosmetically right out of the box there's no blemishes there's no dings there's no scratches in the finish um, one thing that i did notice this lower receiver on the upper portion is thicker than you would typically see uh, which would lead to it being you know stronger overall but i just really don't like the way it looks Depending on your, you know, your barrel length, etc., your AR is going to weigh out of the box five to seven pounds ish. You know, and this is no exception. So let's dive into a few uh, mechanical pet peeves that I found and. This is literally the first thing that I noticed when I picked up the rifle. Uh, when you charge it, you can hear the spring and how much friction there is inside between the uh, spring and the buffer tube. Is this going to cause any major malfunctions? No. But the smoother that we have everything running inside of this platform, the smoother your cyclic rate is going to be and the better, better it's going to perform overall. Another thing we noticed is the gap in between the lower and the upper receiver. Now, if you look at a precision rifle that's an AR-15, you'll notice that the gap is really small and it's machined really tight. And the reason being is because that leads to greater accuracy. Um, with this being wider, um, you do get some movement of the upper receiver on the lower receiver. Now, I'm not gonna say whether or not that this is gonna cause deviations in accuracy at distance, but what can happen is when the round catches the rifling itself, what happens is it torques this upper receiver in whichever direction the rifling's in. So if it's to the left, it torques it to the left. In this case, it's to the right, um, which can cause and lead to deviations in accuracy, especially at greater distances. So my dad opted to get a side charging uh, model because he's left-handed, he wanted to try it out. One thing that I noticed is that you have to have an Allen key to take out your charging handle or your BCG for that matter. Um, that's a con for me because, you know, I don't want to have to have a tool to maintenance my bolt carrier group. It's just my honest opinion. So the last thing we're going to talk about are these iron sights at Bear Creek sent us. And, you know, they seem to be made out of a good quality aluminum and the springs seem to be pretty taut. Uh, so, well, if I can get it down here. The major, major flaw that we found with these iron sights is when you have the rear uh, small aperture in the uh, rear sight and you go to flip it up, as you can see, it's candid and you have no sight picture whatsoever. What leads that to happening is if I flip this up, you can see this center line here at the tip of my finger and you can see these lines here. Well, if you go perfectly in the middle of both these things, you can see a small little round metal ball. And underneath that metal ball, there's a spring that causes tension up against the, your aperture here, and that's what locks it into place. You know, I would recommend Bear Creek uh, to strengthen or stiffen that spring because as of right now, we're taking these sights off and not using them on anything, so. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to stay tuned for the range review of this gun where we beat the absolute living hell out of it. All right, guys, so I want to go over a couple other things that's really going to help you um, get a better idea if this is a route you want to go, okay? Once again, I'm biased approach. Um, everything that we found, like Hayden said, is very minor. The sites, until they fix them, do not purchase their sites for any reason. Now, unless you know how to push and test this equipment, you're never ever going to be able to give a true review. I'll give you an example. On that rear sight, as Hayden said, the smaller aperture, which is used for longer distances, as if it's in the sight window, when you flip it up, the aperture will end up like this because of that weak spring. 
Now, if you flip up the large aperture, okay, which is used for closed quarters because it's a larger hole, it's easier to acquire, and you flip it up, it will be good. Okay, so there's a workaround there, but at the same time, if I'm gonna spend even $20 on something, 15, it better work as it said. And this is an easy fix. All they need to do is create a longer, stiffer spring <clears throat> that is going to fix that problem okay and hopefully they do okay because i believe those sites overall are, are fairly decent um, i don't know how much they cost you'd have to check them out but definitely stay away from the sites until they fix that so what i want to do now is i'm going to kind of introduce you into to the rifle itself here and then i'm going to walk you through some other things that i found and kind of give you some more background um, of what's going on and explain everything to you so the rifle they sent me is a bc15 223 wild rifle <clears throat> all right the wild means that it can handle the pressures of a 556 so you can shoot either 556 or 223 through this platform 16 inch parkerized m4 barrel all right so as technology advances a lot of these companies are trying to say okay listen we have an m4 but everybody else has it. What can we do to create a distinct separation between our platforms and theirs? Some people are offering chrome line barrels, parkerized, um, corrosive resistant coating on the barrels, which are cool. But let me run this by you. Regular M4 Colt carbines, okay? Regular blued guns from top to bottom we took them in the ocean extreme salt water we took them in fresh water diving <clears throat> we took them across the beach okay and beat these platforms up days later you come out spray them off with fresh water take a air hose and compressor and spray it until it's dry lube it and these guns are just like it never saw this water the problem comes in when people just don't give a good proper maintenance okay so my question to you is, if you can take a regular blued M4 and put it in salt water for days, clean it, and it still shoot five, six hundred yards consistently, all right, and there's no integrity issues with the barrel, why do I need any type of coating inside or out? So my thought process on this I will never tell anybody to do it because it does add more protection but the average consumer which I myself am still an average consumer or am an average consumer now will never push a parkerized or chrome line barrel to its maximum capacity so I'm not going to spend the money on it if you want to by all means go for it but I know what a regular blue gun is capable of okay with just basic cleaning and you know, proper maintenance that we should be doing on all our guns, okay? So one to eight twist carbine length gas system, 15 inch M-lock rail system, forged upper billet lower. All right, so uh, here's an email where I'm talking to the BCA rep that contacted me. And at some point through our communication, I said, hey, what do you make so I know? And she lists everything except for the upper which would make sense why it's forged upper and a billet lower. So they make the lower, which means they're getting their upper from somewhere else would also explain why this loose tolerance exists between the upper and lower. Because normally what you're going to find is if a company has a CNC machine and they're making their upper and lowers, um, they're going to machine them really tight. All right. So as Hayden said, we don't know if this is going to affect this performance overall or not here but here's what i would challenge you to do understand that our expectations far exceed anything that the average consumer is going to do okay if you look up the maximum effective range of a 223 or 556 it's, google it, it says 300 meters that's the that's the industry standard all right the average person cannot consistently hit a human-sized target at 300 meters i mean 100 out of 100 shots, 1,000 out of 1,000 shots, okay? So the average consumer cannot push this rifle to its maximum capabilities. This being a 16-inch rifle, it 100%, if it's a 1 MOA barrel as a state, which means 
one inch grouping at 100 yards, I should be able to impact at 750 yards consistently without these crazy gusting winds. All right, that's the, that is what I expect. All right, so at the end of the day, when we're talking about this, even if it did torque slightly and cause some deviation in that trajectory, to the average consumer, is it enough that's going to cause an issue based on your capabilities? And the answer is no. I personally believe even with this, the torquing and the loose tolerances between the upper and lower, that it's still going to be effective at 750 yards. I could be wrong, but we'll see. Um, so down here is the price, $700 plus tax. So about $740 out the door. Um, that gives you everything we said, the parkerized uh, coating and the barrel. Now, I don't know how much the parkerized coating costs. And I don't know how much the Cerakote paint job costs. But I am not going to pay anything more than, you know, about five, dollars $600 max for an out-of-the-box rifle. That's tax and everything, okay? Um, I'm going to rattle can mine or I'm going to leave it black and beat it down. All right, that's just my personal preference. If you want a Cerakoting, by all means, go for it. But what I like to do is I'm going to buy a $499 plus tax rifle that they have on here. I'm going to put the upgraded parts that we deem as necessary to ensure that the platform becomes absolutely comparable to a $2,000 rifle. And at the end of the next video, we're going to show you all the parts that we recommend upgrading um, to ensure that um, you're not going to run any, into any issues. And what you're going to find is it's going to be about anywhere from $1,000 to $1,250. You're going to save anywhere between seven to $900. And the only difference realistically, we're talking about performance-wise, is going to be that logo. It's not even a debate. Okay, the reliability is going to be there, everything. And some of the parts that we're going to upgrade are really not even necessary. It is just what we prefer as a whole, okay? All right, so let's move on to the good stuff. And overall, this is good. I truly believe that this is going to perform well. After talking to them, if something breaks, they are going to replace it. The barrel's uh, one MOA guaranteed out of the box, which is the industry standard for basic rifles like this so we shouldn't have any issue all right so if you go to the bca website you'll see uh, a link to their foundation and, and this is their mission supporting local community law enforcement first responders and veteran military organizations the bca foundation donates items manufactured by bca and or gives financial backing to deserving organizations and individuals this is great Definitely something that I would support, but here, here's my, if I'm going to use this as a thing that says, okay, this is the reason why I want to support this company. I don't trust it 100%, not this company, just what I read because of human nature. I want to know who you exactly you donate to, how often, and how much. What I find as a life coach talking to people as a Christian, I'll say, when was the last time you tithe when we get into this topic? Oh, I tithe. Okay. Well, okay. That's great. When was the last time you tithe? Oh, it's been years. So you haven't tithed between years and now. And then I go as far as say, well, how often did you tithe before then? Well, every now and then. Okay. You're not a tither. You tithe past tense. And then I say, okay, they talk about, hey, I want to find my purpose, you know, and I say, okay, well, it's really going to start in serving other people. And I ask them, how often do you help homeless people? Do you go to uh, women and children's shelters, orphanages? Where do you donate your time to? Oh, I've done that. Okay, when? Oh, it's been a long time ago. Okay, so you don't do it. You've done it in the past. So what people tend to do is use these one or two moments that they've done something in their life, they carry it over to try and make themselves better at the moment. And this is really no different. And anytime a human is behind something, I want to know greater details because it's misleading sometimes. And I'm not saying this company is, but that's just the way my brain works. All right, so I went ahead and typed in BCA reviews. 
uh, b brought up the Better Business Bureau. All right, so like 90-something complaints. And when I, before I started reading, I was like, yeah, I may not do this because um, I heard a lot of bad stuff. I never even heard of the company until they contacted me. But here's what I want to uh, show you and kind of just help you better understand how things occur. This person says, I purchased a barrel on August 4th and still not received a shipping email. Tracking number or anything. All right, so BCA, the first thing I notice is BCA responds to every single one of these complaints, and it's pretty professional in detail. All right, so this one says, hey, you were able to get a hold of a representative on this date uh, requesting a refund. The refund was initiated here. Now, once the complainant reads this, they have an option to accept or reject. Now, this customer accepts that the resolution is satisfactory. Reality is BCA dropped the ball here. I've dropped the ball. I've lost customers. I've failed customers. I've let customers down. I've actually shipped battle belts to two different and I had two different people and I had to get a hold of them and say, hey guys, I will pay your shipping. Can you please change the address and ship it to this person? And they were kind enough to help me out. I've had people to say, hey, your shipping's taking too long because I was out of town. <clears throat> um, I want a refund. And I would issue a refund. Okay, and, I, a lot, and people would say, I expected more out of you. Man, I'm human. And, but all I can do is try to take myself to the next level, dial it down, see where I'm failing, and see if I'm overwhelmed. If I'm overwhelmed, things have to go so the quality doesn't continue to diminish. That To me, that's what makes a good company. All right, so something else to take in consideration. If you scroll through these reviews, one thing you're going to find is people just being buttholes. You know, um, I never received an email after my order and I tried, I waited on the phone for an hour not knowing that BCA was going to respond. So BCA responds in the same manner. Hey, we show that you did in fact talk to someone on this date, this time for this long. And then we also show that there was an email sent on this date at this time. Can you please check your spam folder or confirm that you didn't receive it? And then they come back and say, hey, I do find, just like this gentleman said or person, I do find that the resolution is satisfactory. I have accidentally deleted emails. I've looked over emails. I found them in my spam folder. So once again, it falls back to human nature responding out of emotion instead of doing due diligence and confirming, you know, and learning from it. Now, with that being said, something I do find um, is when people come in, they automatically go to the five-star review and give that low quality review and then come in here and complain. And then after the resolution, they don't think to go back and say, okay, I made a mistake. I overlooked something. Um, they're right. I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to give them a you know, better rating or remove the rating altogether because I don't believe in giving somebody a rating and then me being wrong and then not correcting it. And that actually happens. So, Another thing to think about, it's not the fact that I don't look at people's reviews and I don't listen to what people say, but it's not absolute because it's all based out of emotion, okay? So the next thing is, is I found this site, which I've never heard of before, um, Site Jabber. All right, here they've got 81 reviews, three star. So here's an overview. All right, we got service, value, shipping, returns. So the first four here, I would say that everybody, even though we have our personal, you know, different expectations of what a company standard should be, um, we got a good idea how to gauge this. Service. I didn't like the service. The value. Questionable as a whole, okay? Shipping. Well, if somebody doesn't ship something, I don't get an email, well, I can rate that fairly decent. Returns. Okay, I can rate that really good. Where I start questioning things is quality. I want you to think about this. The average consumer has, they go to, they get a gun, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, but it's, it's arrogance and pride. They go to the range and they shoot a couple hundred rounds, and then everybody's an expert on the internet. For me personally, if you don't have a lot of experience, and I mean thousands and thousands of rounds through different platforms to be able to pick up this gun and shoot it, I don't believe, I cannot listen to somebody's review on the quality of it. 
it just doesn't make any sense, you know? And it's one thing that people have the right to say what they want, but I also have the right not to listen to it because you're not qualified. Now, if something breaks, of course you can give a quality review. But to come out and give any type of quality review based on a lack of experience is just asinine to me. So I'll give you a perfect example here, okay? So here's a couple of them. Firing pin broke after 124 rounds. He still gives it a four-star rating, okay? Now the reality is I've had, I've shot hundreds of thousands of rounds out of the same, well, at least 100,000 rounds out of one carbine, and the firing pin never broke, never failed. But I've also shot other carbines where the firing pin would break, you know, 100,000 or 100 or thousands of rounds into it. Why? Who knows? Who knows at the end of the day? But the question is, since if you go through all these reviews, this is not a common thing. We have to just look at it as a fluke, if you will. Quality control issue, meaning sometimes crap happens. Um, remember, cell phones. All right, I woke up this morning and had an update and missed some texts and missed some calls because I hadn't went through the welcome screen again. Imagine every time you needed a bug update that had to fix some of the software inside your phone. You had to take it into Apple or Verizon or Apple or whoever, uh, AT&T to fix it. You'd be pretty ticked off. Vehicle recalls. Anything that humans build, there's going to be some issues as a whole. So the question is, how many rounds does BCA or any company fire their guns to ensure everything's working properly. For me, it's 500, which is not realistic. Now, we go back to the quality thing here. All right, so broken extractor after 200 rounds. Well, now I'm thinking the bolt itself, which is made out of the exact same metal, was probably a piece of crap. Gave it a one star. All right, not impressed. Got a left-handed side charging 762 by 39 upper. Ah, that's the key right there. All right, and this is going to show you the incompetency of this person. After 200 rounds, my extractor broke like cheap pot metal. Well, he's just ragging on this extractor, leaving an empty casing stuck in the barrel that I can't get out now, hopefully. So, if you know anything about guns, I'm telling you right now, this kid, that person is absolutely uneducated. Um, the fact that they're shooting a 7.62 almost 100% indicates they're shooting steel case ammunition that's lacquer coated. So typically what we find, average consumer, they go out and bang, 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 but they're just wasting ammo. Well, since this lacquer coating becomes tacky, all right, it's not going to come out of the barrel eventually. It's just going to start sticking and melting and it builds up in, into the chamber. And then because this steel is tougher than the extractor, this doesn't come out, well, the extractor can't slip over the head, it's going to break. That's not just this extractor, that's any extractor with steel case ammunition if the, if the ammunition is not lubed properly, okay? Which we're gonna get into in a later video. All right, now, if you know anything about brass, if you ever had a failure to extract, meaning the whatever, um, grime buildup in the chamber, dirty ammunition, overexpansion of the casing, whatever the case may be, the brass doesn't extract. What happens here? All right, this actually bends, all right, it kind of bends through the head of the casing because the brass is softer than the metal of this. So this person was shooting steel case ammunition, did not lube the ammunition properly. He had a gunk buildup of a lacquer inside the chamber. It failed to extract and it broke the extractor, which it would break any extractor. This is not a debate, these are facts. Another possibility, what type of ammunition was he using? Okay, was he using some really crappy ammunition that potentially was overpowdered and overexpanded and stuck in? Would give the exact same result. But his lack of knowledge there um, is, at the end of the day, what caused this. 
All right. At the end of the day, when I put any type of ammunition in my gun, I'm responsible to understand what that ammunition is going to do. If I put a specific oil in my car, I'm responsible for it. If I put air in my tire, I'm responsible to see how much air my tire needs. And if, if I overfill it and I'm going down the road and it pops, whose fault is it? Is it the tire companies or is it me? Is it the rifle companies that you put a round in there that needed certain lubrication to function properly to prevent this? Human nature loves to blame everyone else except for themselves. Exactly. Since the beginning of time, what did Adam do when God came to him? Adam, what did you do? That woman that you gave to me, gave it to me. And he goes, hmm. He goes to Eve and he says, Eve, what have you done? He goes, the serpent deceived me. And all God wanted was them to say, I screwed up. To repent. But we can see this nonsense from the beginning of time in humans until current day. And these are the things that you have to start discerning. And if, like I said, I always say, if you don't know the difference <clears throat> on how this stuff works, like steel case ammo, then you're not going to understand it. If you've never taken the time to take that ammo out there and to find a solution and see exactly what's happening, how can you even say that it's junk ammo? Russia has been using steel case ammo since how many years? And it works just fine. Why is that? It's because they've figured out how to work it. I don't know if they use a lube. I don't know what they do. Okay. So steel case ammo is not junk. It just needs, you know, it needs a little bit of babying, if you will. All right. So I can't look at this broken extractor. Um, as it's a company's fault because if you put steel case ammunition in a rifle and that lacquer coating begins to stick or overpressurizes and the casing sticks, the extractor is more likely going to break on any rifle. Okay, so his lack of education on this concept um, is the reason why he gave a one star. Okay. So I can sit here and do this over and over and over and teach you these things. But at the end of the day, um, it comes out to, you know, getting out and testing some stuff. How did I figure all the, the lub lubrication out on the steel case ammunition? Well, I took some steel ammo out there. I took a little a risk. I didn't listen to everybody. And I pulled the trigger and we started figuring it out. And I actually created a lubrication, which I don't make anymore, to um, fix this issue. Um, you can also uh, seal one. The paste is what I use now. It's pretty comparable to what I did, but I classify that as a tier two product. Okay, has two melting points. Mine had three melting points. Nonetheless, guys, um, that's it for now. I hope you have a good day and God bless and we'll see you next review.